Okay, so today we're going to continue the message portion of our 21 days of prayer. Let me just review a few things that we've covered so far, okay? In week one, we talked about how prayer is really about coming into agreement with God's will. It's not so much about like overcoming God's reluctance and begging him and manipulating him to do something we want. It's not like making a wish up into the heavens and hoping that somehow God hears it. Prayer is coming into agreement with God's will for our lives. Now, the will of God is found in the word of God. So how many of you know that if you want to learn to, to pray according to God's will, how many of you want to do that? You want to make sure you're praying in agreement with God. Anybody with me? Okay, the caffeine's going to kick in at some point in time. Come on, church online. Help me out here. It, it's, if you want to learn to pray according to God's will, then you've got to get your mind saturated in the word of God because the will of God is found in the word of God. So what we're doing in this series is we're learning how to allow the scriptures to influence and inspire our prayers, to give language to our prayers. And as I've mentioned all throughout the this series, we have a prayer guide on our website that really models that, okay? If you want to learn how to do that, get the prayer guide because it has several scriptures that you can use as a guide for, for your prayers, as a model for your prayers. So we're going to do this again today. Last week, we looked at an Old Testament portion of scripture, the prayer of Jabez. We use that as a model for prayer. This week, we're going to look at a New Testament portion of scripture that comes from the writings of the Apostle Paul. And we're going to look at a scripture from Philippians chapter 1. So let me just set this up for you. The Apostle Paul is writing to these Christians living in the Greek city of Philippi. This is a congregation that he loved dearly. In fact, most commentators agree that this is probably Paul's favorite church. I don't know if you're supposed to have favorites. Evidently, Paul had a favorite. He loved the Philippian church. And he opens by, by talking about his prayers for them. Look at this with me, Philippians 1, 3 through 6. He writes this, Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray... I I make requests for, for all of you with joy, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard about it until now. Verse 6, and I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So Paul's praying for them. And, and, and you have to realize Paul was there when this church got started. He planted this church, right? And so he, he was there on day one. He, he was there when this good work, this work of the gospel of salvation began in the lives of the Philippians. Now he's writing to them from house arrest in Rome. He can't be with them, but he's praying that God would finish, that God would complete the good work that he began in their lives. So let me just give you two observations real quick, and you can, you can put these in your notes. Here's the first thing. When we pray, we partner with God to complete his work in us. Come on, I want you to get that in your mind and in your heart. When we pray, we're partnering with God to complete his work in us. As I said before, prayer is about coming into agreement with God. It's about aligning our will with God's will. It's not about just begging and petitioning. It's not overcoming his reluctance. It's tapping into his willingness. And so when we pray, we partner with God. We're actively inviting God. Like, God, I'm going to come alongside of you. I recognize it's your work. I can't save myself. I can't fix myself. But Holy Spirit, I want to cooperate with you. And so as I pray with you, I'm partnering with you to complete the good work that you began in me. Can I get an amen, somebody? That's what prayer is. That's what prayer is. Here's the second thing. Somebody came to church just to hear this today. When you fall short of perfection, remember you're under construction. Come on. Paul says he gives us this picture of salvation as a work to be completed. When, when you fall short of perfection, be encouraged. Just know that you are, you are under construction. And I think so many times we get so frustrated in our walk with Christ and our relationship with God. You know, we have these times in our life where it feels like, you know, two steps forward, one step back. You know, we have bad days. We have days where we give in to temptation, where we, where we just feel like we go backwards and we feel like throwing in the towel. But I love this picture that Paul gives us of salvation, like you are under construction. Come on, it's okay to be a work in progress. I'm a work in progress. You're a work in progress. Turn to somebody, tell them through that mask, you're a work in progress. Come on, church online, just testify in the comments today. I'm a work in progress. It's okay. We're all just a bunch of works in progress. And we're in this together. And so don't give up. Just know that you're under construction and we're praying into God, completing the good work that he began in us. Now, Paul then shifts to a prayer that he prays for the Philippians. That's a really great model of prayer for us. Let's look at it from verses 9 and 11. Philippians 1, 9 through 11. I pray that your love will overflow more and more. And that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding, for I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. 
May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. So Paul prays this beautiful prayer. He prays three things that we're going to look at. These are three prayers that we can grab and pray for ourselves. Okay, so we're looking at portions of Scripture. We're learning how to take Scripture and allow it to inspire our prayers, give language to our prayers. So this is a good opportunity to take some notes right now. Open up your phones. Get out the Redemption app. There's a spot where you can take notes. Three things that Paul prayed for the Philippians that we can grab a hold of and pray for ourselves today. Here's the first one. Number one, we can pray for love that overflows. Come on, we can pray for love that overflows. Look at verse 9 again. I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. Paul prays that they would have a love that overflows. See, one of the reasons Paul is writing this letter, this epistle to the Philippians in the first place, is he's calling them to love and in unity. In fact, there was a dispute that was happening in the church that Paul addresses later on in chapter 4. There were these two ladies, Euodia and Syntyche, who weren't getting along. And Paul basically says, hey, you guys need to get along. Like, don't make me come back there and set you straight. Get along. Love each other. How are you going to make a difference in the world if you Christians can't figure out how to love each other? How many of you know that's not just a word for the, for the Philippians? That's a word for us today. Like, the world needs to see believers who are radically committed to loving each other. Like, if there was ever a time that the world needed that, it's right about now. And so he calls them to a radical love for each other. And he says, I pray that your love will overflow. I love this picture here. Paul, Paul's saying, like, my prayer for you is that you would be able to love others out of the overflow of God's love in your life. It, it's literally, it's, an, it's imagery. It's a, it's a picture here, a word picture. Like, picture like the love of God being poured so richly into your heart that it overflows and you're able to love people out of that. How many of you know there's always a connection between uh, your ability to love people and, and your revelation of God's love for yourself? Anybody discovered this? Like, you can only give to others what you got for yourself. You can all, like, your, your revelation of God's love for you is the, is the basis for your ability to love other people. Jesus gave us the great commandment. Love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. You really can't do the second one if you haven't experienced the first one. This is what Paul's talking about. And then he keeps going. He says, I pray that your love would overflow. And then that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding, that your love is rooted in knowledge and understanding. What does this mean? Well, he, he's praying for them to, to continue growing in knowledge and understanding that reflects the love of God and in turn leads to more of the love of God. Let me put it to you this way, okay? When you became a Christian, when you placed your faith in Christ, you enrolled in the school of God's love. You may not have known it, you may not have realized it, but, but you signed up for the school of God's love. We're all in school together. The curriculum is scripture. The instructor is the Holy Spirit. And the goal of your education is to learn like God has loved. How do you know if you're passing the test if you're loving other people well? You want to gauge to measure your spiritual growth? You want to know how far you've progressed in this? Paul doesn't say it's all of your fancy knowledge, how well you can quote the Bible backwards and forwards. No, it's knowledge based in how well you can love. Like how well do you love others? So let me ask you this question. Do you know how to love well? How are you doing in, in, the love, in the love department? Do you know how to love well? We've all heard the cliche a thousand times, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And it's one of those kind of cliche statements, but if you stop and think about it, isn't it true? People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. The people who made the biggest difference in your life, the teachers, the coaches, the mentors, the loved ones, they were people who cared for you. It's not because they were so smart and they knew everything. How many of you have ever known someone who was a know-it-all but didn't exude love and they really didn't make that big a difference in your life? Anybody? Am I the only one? Anybody? Anybody know anybody like that on social media? They know everything but they never come across as loving. Come on, let's keep it real. I, I've got a Christian friend and they don't go to our church, by the way, so truthfully, I'm not picking on anybody here. Our church, for the most part, behaves themselves on social media. We police you if you don't. But I have a friend who... Um, he, he's always on social media, and he's a know-it-all. Like, he knows everything. He has the right answer for everything. And he's always posting, like, you know, he's an angry Christian. Like, he's always angry. He comes across as judgmental. He's always got the right answer. He's ready to argue with everybody. But he, because he doesn't exude love, he never, he never changes anybody's mind. 
Like, he just wastes his time. He turns people off. Like, I have never seen an unbelieving Christian, I mean, an, an unbeliever who's not a Christian, write in on one of his posts, thank you so much for what you wrote today. Like, you have really persuaded me to become a Christian. Like, whatever you got, I want more of that. I, I've never seen anybody write that. And sometimes I want to write him and say, hey, dude, why don't you get off of social media and learn how to love somebody? You want to make a difference in the world? Why don't you get off of social media and go out and actually learn how to love someone? You ever feel that way? Like, love somebody who's right in front of you. How, how many of you know the world needs Christians who know how to love people? Love the person right in front of you. Black, white, gay, straight, conservative, liberal, people you agree with, people you disagree with. Learn how to love well. That's how you make a difference in this world. <laughs> That's how you make a difference in this world. Well, what about all the difficult people, Pastor? What about the people who are difficult to love? Anybody got a difficult person in your life who's hard to love? Don't nudge the person sitting next to you. That's not nice. Come on. Spouses, significant others, don't look at each other. That's not nice. We all got those difficult people, right? Like, wouldn't it be easy to love everybody the way Jesus called us to love people if it wasn't for those difficult people in our lives? And this is why we love out of the overflow, the overflow of how God has loved us. I was recently listening to the audio version of, of the famous book, The Hiding Place by Corrie Ten Boom. And uh, Corrie Ten Boom, if you don't know her story, it's a famous Christian story. She was a, a Dutch woman who lived in Holland during World War II, during the time of the Nazi occupation. And, and they, she had a devout Christian family who hid Jews from, from the Nazis. And, and uh, her story really became tragic. They ended up being arrested and they spent time in this German like prison camp called Ravensbrück in, in Germany. She lost her father. She lost her beloved sister. And then when she got out of jail, she traveled all over, all over Europe uh, preaching the gospel and sharing her testimony of how God brought her through all of that and, and all that she learned in those experiences and has this just beautiful, amazing testimony. And in one story she told, she was in Munich, Germany and sharing the gospel, sharing her testimony. And after the service, one of her prison guards that she actually recognized from Ravensbrook came up to her and held his hand out to shake her hand. And she said, everything inside of me didn't want to forgive this man. Nothing inside of me wanted to shake this man's hand. Like all of that, that bitterness and unforgiveness was there because of the, the hurt of what the German people ha had done to her. And she prayed twice for God to help her to forgive him. And she extended her hand to this man. And when she did, she said, I felt like a current flowed through my arm into this man. And I felt an overwhelming love in my heart from him, from God. And she said, I learned that day that Jesus not only commands us to forgive our enemies, but he gives us the love love to do it. See, that's a picture of overflowing love. That, that's a picture of love that's supernatural. There was nothing in Corey Ten Boom that, in the natural that would allow her to forgive this prison guard who had, you know, overlooked terrible things that were done to her. But she was able to love him and forgive him out of the overflow of God's love in her life. And so we can begin to pray just like the Apostle Paul. God, give me a love that overflows. Come on, God, give me a love that it isn't even from me. It's from you. God, if it comes from you, I can even love the unlovable people in my life. I can love that annoying coworker. I can love that person on social media who drives me crazy. God, I can love my family. I can love the people I disagree with. God, it's not my love. It's a love that comes from you. When I recognize how much you've loved me, how much you gave yourself for me, how much you love me despite me doing nothing, despite me being a sinner and not deserving your love, God, I can love out of that overflow. I can love other people. Come on, that's our prayer. That's our prayer. We're going to take scripture. We're going to get inspired, and we're going to pray it back to God. Here's the second thing, number two. Three prayers that Paul prayed that we can grab a hold of, and we can begin to declare in prayer for ourselves. Here's the second thing he prayed for. He prayed, he's, and it's a prayer we can pray. We can pray that you can discern what is best. You can learn to pray that you can discern what is best. God, help me to discern what is best. Look at verse 10. For I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. Here's, here's how the, new, new, uh, the NIV translation puts it, that you may be able to discern what is best. The New American Standard Bible says, so that you may approve the things that are excellent. What is Paul saying? Follow him in the process here as you begin to love people out of the overflow of God's love. As you grow and increase in knowledge and understanding that reflects that love, it results in you developing godly discernment. You being able to discern what is best, to discern what really 
matters in life. Now, I love this word discernment because it has this connotation of sifting and sorting through different choices and, and options. Like the idea here is that God wants us to develop the ability to distinguish what's best in a world of competing possibilities, competing options, choices, options, like being able to sort through what is best for our lives, what really matters for, for our lives. And this is really biblical wisdom. This is the picture that we get of wisdom in the Bible. This is the wisdom of Proverbs. It's not that in every situation I'm going to be able to remember every Bible verse to help me know exactly what to do. That's wonderful. You want to get God's word in your, in your heart so it's there when you need it. But here, here's the, the more accurate picture. It's that the word of God trains my thinking. It trains my wisdom. It trains my discernment so that I can begin to think how God wants me to think in any given situation and do what honors him. Like, this is biblical wisdom. This is what we might call moral perception. Paul gives us a word picture for this in Ephesians chapter 1, 18. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened. Did you know that, you're, that figuratively that your heart has vision to it, that your heart has eyes? It sees. Like, what are you seeing morally from your heart? That's the picture we see here. How many of you know that there are a lot of competing options every day? A lot of competing choices. How many of you know that there are so many things in this life that are competing for our attention, for your heart, for your finances, for your time? Like on a, on a regular basis, any given day, we're trying to sort through what's right, what's wrong. And sometimes there's some gray areas and it's not so easy to know what to do. And, and I think on a regular basis, we find ourselves trying to do the best thing to honor God. Trying to do, like, make the be best decisions for ourselves, for our families. Let me give you an example of sorting through the options, okay? A couple, uh, last year, Amy and I painted our house. When we bought our house, it was a reddish brown color, and the paint was really faded on certain parts of the house. It was really due for a paint job, and we wanted to change the color to gray. And so we got a bunch of samples of paint, and we started painting samples on the back of the house. Now, men, how many of you know that women see shades of color that we didn't even know existed? <laughs> My wife always thinks I'm colorblind. I'm like, no, biologically, like women see shades of color that I didn't even know existed. And so we started putting all of these different samples of paint on the back of the house, and we thought we had the right gray color that we wanted to go with. So we painted a little portion of the house that gray, and then Amy was like, no, I don't like it. I don't like the undertone. I'm like, I didn't even know it had an undertone. I don't like the undertone. we got to change the shade, right? It's like 50 shades of gray, you know? So she runs out, and we get another sample. We had the painter get another sample, and she wanted one with a green undertone, okay? I don't know. You could have a gray paint with a green undertone. We painted one whole side of the house. We painted the front of the house, and while it was drying, we looked at it. We're like, we're just not quite sure. We were trying to discern. I'm not sure it's like the, the right color. And then as sunset, as the sun began to go down that day, we realized the house looked green, not gray. A lot more green than gray. We're like, nope, it's wrong. Send the paint her back, get another, get another color, right? And then finally, we got it right. Finally, after sorting through all of those shades of gray, we, we got it right. Why did we sort through all of those color, colors? Because we didn't want to settle for something good. We wanted what was best. We wanted something that was excellent, something that, that we loved. How many of you know that it's been said that good is the enemy of best? Good is the enemy of best. Come on, what do you want for your life? Do you want what's good or do you want what's best? When you get on a plane, do you want the good pilot or do you want the best pilot? <laughs> when you order pizza, do you want to order pizza from the good pizza place or the best pizza place? Come on, if you're in the NFL playoffs, do you want the football team with the good quarterback or, or the best quarterback? Come on, we want to go after what's, we want to be able to discern what's best for our lives. God's best for our lives. And we have so many options. So many choices, so many voices and opinions in our lives every day. How do we choose what's right? How do we choose what's best for our career, for our business, for our relationships? How do we spend our time and our money well? How do we, how do we treat people in a way that honors God? How do we raise kids for you parents in a way that honors God? How do we discern what's best? best, what really matters. Paul gives us another key here. Are you ready for it? He, he basically says, keep eternity in mind. When you're making decisions, when you're discerning life choices, everyday life choices, big life choices, keep eternity in mind. Here's what he says. Look at it again. I, I want you to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. 
until the day that Jesus comes back. Like, whatever decision you make, if you want to know if it's a good, solid, wise decision, should I get in a relationship with this person? Should I invest my money this way? Should I go here? Should I do that? Should I allow this influence into my heart, into my mind? You're filtering through some decisions. Here's a really good paradigm, right? Do whatever leads to you being more pure and blameless in the sight of God. How many of you know you can't go wrong if you end up there? It might even be a really unpopular choice. It might be a difficult choice. If it results in you becoming more pure and blameless before God, it's a good choice. That, that's a good choice. Here's the other thing Paul says, right? Keep eternity in mind because here's, here's what's ultimately on, on our hearts and on our minds. We want to live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. Like whatever decision you're making, keep eternity in mind. I was recently reading some of the writings of Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards was a famous, like one of those famous fiery New England preachers from the Puritan era in the 1700s. His most famous sermon was a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Anybody want to go back to that era? How many of you are glad that you have a pastor who preaches grace? Yes, thank you. <laughs> but I mean, it was from that really kind of fire and brimstone era of preaching in, in New England and very, very powerful preacher and Jonathan Edwards actually wrote down 70 resolutions that he tried to live his life by. Like these were hardcore, really self-disciplined resolutions that he added to over time. And I had never read these before. I was reading through these resolutions, and I got to number 19. I'm going to read this for you. He, 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 said, he wrote this, I resolved never to do anything which I should be afraid to do if I expected it would not be above an hour before I should hear the last trump. As in the last trumpet sound when Jesus is about to return. And here's what he's basically saying. I resolved that I, I was never, I'm never going to do anything that I wouldn't do if I knew Jesus was coming back within the hour. Does that give you some perspective? Does, you know, that was convicting to me, you know. Like, would I talk to my spouse that way if I knew Jesus was coming back within an hour? Would I watch that show if I knew Jesus was coming back within an hour? Would I react that way to that person in traffic if I knew Jesus was coming back within an hour? That's convicting, isn't it? I mean, talk about living with eternity in mind. Do you know every now and then it's a good practice to wake up and just think, Lord, how would I live this day today if it were my last day? I know that may sound a little bit morbid for some of you, but to realize our lives are fragile. Come on, the psalmist said, teach me, O Lord, to number my days. Lord, help us to have discernment. This life is too short. Your life is too short, and your calling is too great for you to waste your life on things that don't even matter. And one of the great tragedies of this culture that we're living in is we're living around people every day who are living their lives for things that, when it's all said and done, won't even matter. You can be smart, you can be affluent, you can drive a sexy car, your kids can go to private school, you can live in a beautiful house and still end up living your life for things that, when it's all said and done, don't even matter in light of eternity. Oh, I know I'm not getting through to anybody today, but if we could really grasp this, it would, it would change our priorities. It would change our hearts. It would change the decisions that we make. We can learn to pray this way, God, help me to have discernment for what's best. God, I want my decisions to reflect what really matters. Come on, God, give me the gift of discernment. This is a prayer we can take a hold of and pray. Here's the third thing. If you're taking notes, number three, a prayer that Paul prayed that we can pray. And here it is. We can pray for character that brings glory to God. Character that brings glory to God. Look at verse 11. Here's what Paul prays. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. Come on, Paul prays for, for character, not just any kind of character, but character that leads and brings glory to God. God. See, I love this picture because the work of God in our lives, salvation is really meant to be transformational. You know, it's not just about one day we're going to get to heaven and sing kumbaya. That's wonderful, the, the fulfillment of the promise of salvation. But salvation is supposed to look like something in the here and now, in, in the present. It looks like transformation in your life. Like Paul understood there was a past, present, and future aspect to God's work of salvation. Remember how he started, right? Like you're under construction. God is bringing his work of salvation in your life to completion. And so it should be. God working in your life should be producing fruit. This is what he says. He gives a word picture. There should be the fruit of your salvation. How many of you know that fruit is the result of a, 
of a process. You don't have to be a farmer to know that. There's a process, right? You take minerals and soil and sun, you know, sunshine and water. You put it all together. And if a plant is healthy, it produces fruit. It's the result of a process. Paul's saying, man, if God's working in your life, there should be, there should be some fruit to show that, that, that there's, a, there's a process happening in your life. When I think about the fruit of righteousness, I think about the fruit of the Spirit. How many of you remember the fruit of the Spirit from Galatians chapter 5? Let me read this list, okay? Come on, have a little honest moment with yourself, you and the Holy Spirit. How evident are these things in your life? Whenever you get to a list in Scripture, it's always great to just review that list and just say, Lord, how much of the, if it's a positive list, how much of that positive stuff do I have? If it's a negative list, how much of that's in my life? Always take some time when you get to a list like this in the Bible. Here's Galatians 5, what it says about the fruit of the Spirit. It's love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How much of those things do you have in your life? Those are the evidence. These are the fruit of salvation in your life. And can I just say, one of my greatest joys as a pastor is to see people grow. It's to see people grow in their relationship with Jesus. I love it when people stick around long enough. They put down roots. They just get committed to the house of God, to the family of God. They just put down roots. And they stick it out over time. They serve and they love and they give and they pray. And they have those seasons sometimes where, where it's two steps forward, one step back. But they stick with it and I get to see the growth in their life. And I'm so encouraged by the people who have who've just stuck around here for, for a couple years. And, I've, and they've been around long enough for me to get to see some of the fruit of the Holy Spirit take place in, in, in their lives, grow in, in their lives. Let me ask you this question. How many of you have been following Jesus long enough to be pleasantly surprised by the fruit of the Holy Spirit? spirit in your life. Anybody? Anybody follow Jesus long enough? I mean, pleasantly surprised. Like over time, you were just following, you were just praying, you were just pursuing, you were just staying in a relationship with other believers, not giving up on this whole thing. And surprisingly, one day you got into a situation and you all of a sudden had more love than you ever had before. Like, I don't even know where this love came from. Like, I can't stand that person, but some kind of way, like Corey Ten Boom, I have a love for them. Some of y'all got joy. Like you used to be miserable, cranky, looking like you were constipated and sucking on lemons all the time. And now you got the joy of the Lord as your strength. And you don't even know where it came from because it didn't come from you. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Some of you, you got, you got peace. You used to be freaked out all the time. And now there's a peace over your life, a peace that passes all understanding. Some of y'all got patience. Come on, there's that person in your life, that coworker that you always wanted to slap. Whenever you saw them, the spirit of slap came over you. But now you got patience for them. I don't even know where that patience came from. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? Redemption Community Church, it's the fruit of the Spirit in your life. It's the further spirit, patience in your life. Kindness. You're a New Yorker. You used to have an edge on you, cutting people off in Grand Central if they got in your way. And now, it's just kindness over your life. The edge is just diminished. People want to be around you. Goodness. Faithfulness. Where you used to be marked by fear. There's a faith in you. You never used to have gentleness, self control. See, that, that's the fruit of the Spirit. Come on, hang in there long enough. Come on, church online, hang in there long enough. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. You're, you're a work in progress. You are under construction. And if we would just trust God, if we'll just pray into this, if we'll just be faithful, you will eventually begin to be pleasantly surprised by the fruit of your salvation. So let me ask you a weird question this morning. How's your fruit? <laughs> How's your fruit? Inspect your fruit. Are you getting the results that Scripture talks about here? Are you really seeing the results. If you go to the gym, you want to see results. Come on, if you get on a healthy diet, you want to see some results. You want to look better in that bathing suit for that trip that you're taking to the Caribbean. Can I get an amen? Somebody. I've been fasting. I'm losing a few pounds. I'm just saying. I'm not doing it for that, but I don't mind looking at myself in the mirror a few extra seconds these days because a few of the pounds are coming off. You know, so there's love handles here. All right, now I'm leaving some of it because Amy needs something, you know, some love handles here. Come on, let's have some fun in church today. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. But let me ask you this question. How is, how, how's your fruit? Are, are you getting the results that you really desire? Character that reflects and brings glory to God. Here's our prayer. God, fill me with the fruit of your salvation, God. Come on, God, I don't want to just go through the motions, but God, I want to see results in my life. God, I recognize there's nothing I can do on my own, but God, I'm trusting you to do a good work in me. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to end this. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. Stand with me. 
Maybe church online, you want to stand up in your living room. You're in your pajamas eating breakfast. You want to stand up with us. Come on, just stand up. There's something powerful about this, and we're going to declare the word of God over our lives. What we've been talking about doing is finding the promises of God in Scripture, finding these inspired passages of, of Scripture that speak to us, and praying them back to God, declaring them over our lives. So when you find a passage like this, when you open up that prayer guide this week and you see all the different Psalms and the Lord's Prayer, all those different examples, you can begin to pray Scripture over your life. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to end today by declaring the word of God in prayer over our lives. We're going to pray this full of faith. We're going to pray this believing. We're going to pray this trusting that, that the Holy Spirit is going to do a work in our lives. So would you declare, would you boldly declare these scriptures over your life today? And maybe you don't even feel like saying it. Maybe you struggle to mean it when you pray it, but today we're going to pray it full of faith, trusting that it's God who's able to do the work in our lives. So let's put that first one up on the screen. Would you pray this with me? We're going to make some declarations. Here's the first one. Declare it with me. I declare that God who began a good work in me will bring it to completion. Okay, you get a do-over because that was the first one, okay? You get a do-over. Would you declare it with me out loud? I want to hear you through that mask. Come on. I want you to declare this with me. Church online, maybe somebody wants to type this in the comments. I declare that God who began a good work in me will bring it to completion. That's better. Here's the next one. We're warming up. Say this with me. Full of faith, with boldness, trusting, believing. I declare that my love will overflow more and more with knowledge and understanding. Come on, you're doing good. Here's the third one. Let's say it together. I declare that I'd be able to discern what is best in every area of my life. And here's the fourth one. Let's say it like we really believe it. I declare that I will be filled with the fruit of righteousness to your glory and praise, oh Lord. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. I'm rooting for you today. I'm cheering for you today. I came to church to encourage somebody. If you felt like giving up, if you felt like a failure, if you felt like this whole Christianity thing isn't working out so great for you, or you really haven't lived up to your expectations for yourself, be encouraged today because you are under construction. You may be short of perfection, but you're under construction. God hasn't forgotten you. God sees you. He's at work in your life. And if you just hang in there long enough, you're going to begin to see the results. Hang in there long enough. You're going to see that love and that joy and that peace and that patience come into your life. Does anybody believe that this morning? Anybody believe that church online? Do you believe that this morning? Come on, let's pray into that together. Let's declare that over our lives today. Father, we thank you that you who began a good work in us, that God, you're faithful. God, you're faithful when we're not faithful. God, you're faithful even when we sin, even when we fail, even when we have bad days. God, you don't have bad days. You're constant, you're steady, and you're faithful to complete the good work that you began in our lives. And we hold on to that hope today, God. God, we pray that you would give us an overflowing love. If there was ever a time in our lives when, when believers needed an overflowing love, God, give us an overflowing love. God, we're asking you for the gift of discernment, that we wouldn't just go through this life going through the motions, but God, we would be able to discern what is best, what is good, what really matters. And God, we pray for the fruits of the Spirit, the fruit of our salvation to be evident in our lives, your good work, the results and the evidence of your good work in our lives. We trust you to do it. We believe you to do it, and we thank you for it in advance. In Jesus' name, if you believe it, would you say amen. Amen.